And in we go, moving right along through various extremity injury patterns. We're going to jump into knee stuff. Again, um, uh, the knee is not a particularly well-designed joint. It doesn't have much in the way of bony stability. So the knee, just like the shoulder, we're going to care a lot about soft tissue injuries. So just fundamentally, I think it's worth sort of stepping back and thinking for a second. The reason the Ottawa ankle rules work is because the ankle has a lot of bony stability. And so I don't care about the ligamentous injuries. So all I really want to know is if they have a fracture. And if they don't, then they don't need x-rays because I don't care about the ligamentous injuries. The reason the Ottawa knee rules, and we'll discuss them in a moment, don't work that well is because I do care about the ligamentous injuries. So it's not like some orthopod's going to operate on someone's anterior cruciate ligament without getting x-rays. They're going to get x-rays for sure. So you're not going to... You're not going to prevent someone from getting films down the road. So poor bony stability. The menisci are really important to provide cushion and depth to the joint. Um, they're really important for the way the femoral condyles articulate with the tibial plateau. Uh, the ligaments interior in the knee, the uh, anterior cruciate and posterior cruciate are the main ones that force stability in terms of that axis. And then the lateral coll uh, collateral ligaments are also quite important as well. Large range of motion is, uh, is also an issue, so it's got a big and generous joint capsule. You can't have a large range of motion without a generous joint capsule, and so you'll see big effusions, and if there's an inflammatory process, the knee will get huge. If there's a hemarthrosis, the knee will get huge. Muscles uh, are important to the stability as well, and this is why when people have a ligamentous injury to their knee after they fix what they're going to do or immobilize them, a prolonged period of rehab in which you strengthen the muscles which cross the knee so that you add muscle strength to knee stability is quite important. The iliotibial band runs along the lateral thigh and can become inflamed and cause pain as well. All right, plain films of the knee, probably among the most useless films. You look at someone, you palpate the bony structures, the patella doesn't hurt, the femoral condyles don't hurt, and the tibia and proximal fibula don't hurt you pretty much know those films are going to be negative with the possible exception of, an, of a radiographic effusion. Um, you need an AP and lateral minimum. Some places will go ahead and add obliques or a sunrise view. I think routinely obtaining five views of the knee is probably not necessary, but your radiologist will so, sort of have different protocols for how they do this. But you can think about it when you're ordering them. At our hospital, we have a choice, at least on the menu, between a three and a five view and I usually do a three view. I only order five views when, I, when I'm worried about the tibial plateau and want to get a look at it um, with a little more detail because tibial plateau fractures, while they can be very dramatic and obvious, they also can be quite subtle. As uh, the last speaker was just pointing out, remember that exam is really important in these extremity injuries. And one of the things I'm a broken record saying to the residents and, and mid-level providers at our hospital is exam plus x-ray is greater than x-ray no matter how much you know about x-ray. So the radiologist who's reading the films doesn't know where the patient hurts. So that makes looking at a hand film or, or a knee film or any other film, they're at a disadvantage. If you've examined them, you should know a lot more about where you're focusing your attention when you do get the film. Come on. Ottawa knee rules. So here they are. As I said, I'm not a huge fan of these. I do like the Ottawa ankle rules, but the reason I'm not a big fan is because the ligaments are important. They're very similar to the ankle rules. You've got to be able to bear weight for four steps immediately and after. Um, you're looking for bony tenderness at the head of the fibula, patellar tenderness, and you want to know whether they can flex. And then there's an age limitation because um, as people get osteopenic, they can have subtler fractures that won't be picked up. There's a whole slew of tests for the knee. And these tests really, really work great when the person didn't injure their knee that day. If you can see them four or five days later after they've had ice and pain meds and some of the swelling's gone down, then you can really use these, these exam maneuvers to find out what's wrong with them. The problem is with the acutely injured knee with a big effusion that's very painful, these, uh, these exam techniques are fairly limited and you're really down to a few tests that you can use in that setting, which is, is there an anterior drawer or a posterior drawer? How, how lax is the knee? But we have a whole variety of tests here that are designed to look for 
uh, the menisci, the aptly grind, and the Thessaly maneuver, and the pivot shift test for the ACL, posterior anterior drawer, Lachman's and McMurray's. Um, and so there are a variety, and these, this isn't a complete menu either. These are worth reviewing with the acknowledging up front, the caveat that with the acutely injured knee, you can't do many of these things well. All right, cruciate ligaments, really important. The anterior cruciate is far more commonly injured than the posterior cruciate. Many times the patient will report a pop. They're able to bear weight. Sometimes they keep skiing or skating or whatever it was they were doing when it happened for a little bit. Then they develop a huge hemarthrosis over the uh, next intervening hours, six to 12 hours, and the exam will be very difficult. They're involuntarily guarding around their knee with all the large muscle groups of their thigh. They may have a Lachman and anterior drawer test that is positive, and that's really the most important one you're looking for. And these almost never happen in isolation. If they have an ACL that's out, the chances that they have a partial collateral ligament injury or a partial meniscal tear is very high. In one large study that looked at knees, they averaged 2.1 injuries. So when they had something wrong with them, they always had other soft tissue elements injured as well. And that's where you get into this fashionable phrase when you see an acute knee that the x-rays are negative, that's got an obvious soft tissue injury, that actually maybe the more accurate thing to call it is an internal derangement of the knee, like it needs a psychiatrist. <laughs> After a little bit of a, you know, analytical therapy and some dreams, we'll know what it is, but for now, it's just an internal derangement of the knee with several things out. Um, now, the films are usually negative with these, but there is some exceptions. A Sagan fracture, which is a little fracture off the just proximal to where the proximal head of the fibula is. Looks like a nothing fracture, but it's actually a fairly important finding because 95% of the time, if there's a Sagan fracture, there's an ACL injury. So that's why it's so important. These people want to be placed in a knee immobilizer, crutches, pain control. I don't always drain the effusion. In fact, I would say I rarely drain the acute effusion. If the effusion is so big that the distension of the joint capsule seems to be a prominent component of pain, then I will, then I will drain the effusion. Just, and you'll need at least a 60 cc syringe. It's not uncommon to get 100 cc's of bloody joint fluid out, 120 cc's of bloody joint fluid. And if I am gonna go to the trouble to do that, I almost always instill some half percent Marcane, four, five, six cc's back into the knee joint so that their narcotic needs over the next 24 hours will be less. But to say that I would tap every effusion in this setting, that's just not the case. I do it when it's severe, when joint distension appears to be a big component of their pain. Here's an image, a drawing. The drawing's actually a little better than the x-ray, but you see this little, it looks like a nothing fracture. And what that fracture is caused by is an avulsion fracture by the lateral collateral ligament. But when that avulsion occurs, it almost always means the ACL is out. Big effusion as well. Orthopedic referral, they're probably gonna need something done either arthroscopically or open to their knee. All right, a tibial spine fracture. I had one of these just the other day. They're one of, they're, they're, you should look for them when you do get knee films. And one of the things about them is they meet, usually it's avulsed, the, uh, it's an avulsion fracture pulled off by the ACL. The beauty of this when they have this is, as you probably know, if you tear the ACL in the middle of the band, ACLs don't heal. They have to be repaired. But bone does heal. So if you have a sizable tibial avulsion fracture and that can be tacked down, then that, that will actually allow them to take advantage of bony healing, which is gonna be much better than an ACL repair. And so it's important for that. Relatively uncommon though. And that and a second fracture are really the only findings you're gonna find that are bony findings in acute knee injuries. All right, O'Donohue's terrible triad is another example of what we talked about. Uh, where there's more than one injury. So this is typical of sports. You got a shoe with spikes on it, planted in the turf, and someone comes in and hits the knee this way and it collapses inward. When it collapses inward, it pulls off, the, the medial collateral ligament is torn. Because the medial collateral ligament attachment is close to the medial meniscus, the medial meniscus is torn. And then when they give way and the knee really gets sloppy towards the inside, the ACL goes. So you have this terrible triad, which is, as shown here, medial collateral ligament, medial meniscus, ACL. Now the reverse, planted foot, 
and now the person's coming in from between my legs and blows my knee out this way, that's when you're going to get the Sagan fracture. So Sagan fracture is sometimes called the reverse O'Donohue's triad, and there can be a triad with it as well. And so here you see the Sagan mechanism where someone's coming in on the inside of your leg and the tackle below, as opposed to the O'Donohue's uh, terrible triad, which is the player down on the right. Here's some images of what a meniscus looks like, and they're fairly stylish. Obviously, they don't look like these little blue Cs, but they're sort of like that. And you should, uh, what I like about this image and the reason we included it in the lecture is because it shows you the different styles of tears. You can have a little bucket handle tear. That's fairly common. It's the bucket handle tear that results in a locking knee where that bucket handle flops into the joint and gets pinched. You can have transverse little, little tears down on the corners, a horn tear. Um, and these are, are quite common. And with the complaints with these meniscal injuries are um, often delayed pain. They have catching or they feel like their knee is going to give way. They often will complain of a feeling of instability or a lack of faith in their knee, particularly when they're going downstairs, where the menisci are really important to keep the femoral condyles from rocking out. They're going downstairs and they just feel like their knee might give out and they have a lot of anxiety because they're at the top of a flight of stairs. And if their knee was to give out, they have a sense that bad things might happen from that position. Collateral ligaments, rarely repaired because they're very broad. You should think of a collateral ligament as like a big, almost a hands width structure that goes all the way across on each side. And so you tear them partially frequently, but completely tear them only rarely. So most of the time, they're immobilized in a knee immobilizer. Whatever healing that can be done is done. They are not frequently surgically repaired. Rehab is more important. However, the medial uh, collateral ligament is much thicker and more important than the lateral. So the medial collateral is more of the two. Like I say, repair is rare for both. But if you're going to repair one, it's more often the medial collateral than the lateral collateral. The medial collateral ligament and the medial meniscus are, generally speaking, stronger and more important than the lateral collateral and the lateral meniscus. In fact, the lateral meniscus is so sneaky that even MRI misses a substantial portion of lateral collateral, uh, not lateral collateral ligament, of lateral meniscal injuries. MRIs miss lateral meniscal injuries. All right, knee dislocations. When a knee gets dislocated, the important thing for you to know as a, as a clinician is that it almost never comes to you in the dislocated state. So dislocated knees relocate spontaneously. Only rarely when the thing is twisted. Every once in a while you'll see something gruesome where the knee is dislocated and turned at 90 degrees. So the knee is pointing this way and the foot is pointing that way. And you kind of look at it and you go, that's not right. Um, and they usually are fairly easy to reduce, but most of the time you don't see that. What you see is a patient comes in with a big effusion, a big swollen knee. They have, I won't quite call it poop. They don't have quite have pain out of proportion, but it really looks to be in the, you know, the more severe end of knee injuries that you've ever seen. And what you should do with those is just see if they have laxity, anterior drawer, posterior drawer. So if you see a patient who has an anterior drawer sign, that means the ACL is out. If they got a posterior drawer, that means the PCL is out. If they have both, that's called bicruciate ligamentous instability. Whenever you see bicruciate ligamentous instability, that should mean something to you. And what it means is the knee was dislocated. So now your attention should shift from the knee to the popliteal artery because dislocated knees are very well associated with popliteal arterial flaps. They can have pulses when you see them and still have a flap. So most people believe that just doing things like a pulse assessment is insufficient at this point. Just looking for capillary refill, insufficient. For me, a dislocated knee means CT angio of that leg, looking for a flap. So that's why bicruciate ligamentous instability is really important because it signals the need for a more serious workup. And then when you find those arterial flaps, they don't all get surgery, but some of them do. So very important. 
by cruciate ligamentous instability. These are the worst knee injuries you'll see. It means it was dislocated. Your attention turns to the popliteal artery. Remember, the reason the popliteal artery is injured there is because the popliteal artery is fairly pinned. It can't really move around. So, it's, so where the popliteal artery trifurcates just around the fibular head, it's basically anatomically pinned down there. And then it's also pinned down above the knee where it comes out of the adductor canal. So, the, so it's like a little band of vascular tissue on the back side of the knee. When the knee dislocates, it's really hard not to injure it. And particularly if it dislocates posteriorly. Patellar dislocations, these are great fun because they usually will go in with a little gentle pressure and a little extension of the leg. It's usually younger people where they have lax knees. It's women more than men or girls more than boys. They can't straighten their, th their knee. And you, this picture is a great picture because the patella is like, looks like the patella is trying to move to another state. Um, <clears throat> and, and they're really fun because they often relocate with, with not much effort. And the patient is, has almost complete relief of pain when, they, when that happens, so they're great. Now, every once in a while, you'll see one of these patella dislocations up on edge, like a quarter that you've stood on a table on the rough edge. And that'll freak you out when you first see it, because you'll be like, what is that? That doesn't look like a patella. Um, and those will also relocate with the usual method, except occasionally if they won't go. There is this documented thing where there's an intervening band of tissue that prevents them from going. So every once in a while, one of those ones standing on edge won't relocate. Don't try and force it at that point. Call ortho, because they may, be, may need to be reduced in an open fashion. But most of the time, they do. So this is, we're talking about a rare injury that rarely won't, won't be dis relocatable. So it's quite uncommon. All right, distal femur fractures, you see all these classifications. They're not really important. They're, for, they're important for orthopods who are determining what they're doing in repair. They're not important for us in diagnosis. But it's, you want to pay attention to whether there's an intraarticular component. That's really important to your orthopods. You want to seek other injuries, right? High forces are involved in femur fractures in healthy adults. Your femur doesn't just snap willy-nilly. So you need to start paying attention to their chest, their abdomen, you know, a, a, a more um, uh, open-minded workup considering other injuries. Do they have a head injury, et cetera? Now, Having noted that, a femur fracture, it's not uncommon for them to bleed a liter, liter and a half. So they also might need a line. They might need resuscitated. It's appropriate to type and cross them. You want to splint these. Um, they all need admission for pain control. These are not really referable out to the office. These all need to be admitted. All right, tibial plateau, you have this drawing down here showing a couple of different uh, ways of tibial plateau fractures. And they can be really dramatic, like the x-ray on the right, or fairly subtle, like the circle on the left, and they can be even more subtle than that. And so that's where you get into ordering five views of the knee with obliques or sometimes asking specifically for plateau views. And if you have strong suspicion that there's a plateau fracture and you're not quite sure based on the plane films, it's fine to go ahead and CT these as well. I would talk to someone about that. Um, your consultant, uh, uh, if you're working with a physician as well, I might discuss this. But if you see them, the orthopod's almost always going to CT them anyway to define the injury better for operative repair. So a lot of these are going to get a CT at some time along the way. Um, so don't hesitate to moving to that level of imaging if you need to. Osgood Schlatter's disease, the, the lump, the heartbreak of the lump of the knee. I love Osgood Schlatter's disease. By the way, you can have a similar disease of the patella, which is called Sending Larson Johansson. You, you get a theme in there, Osgood, Schlatter, Sending, Larson, Johansson. This happens in tall people, Scandinavians, hence all the names for these are of that group. But it can happen in anyone. Rest, ice, compression, elevation does it. I love the fact that there's something about this name, Osgood, Schlatter's, that patients remember it forever. Like you'll be seeing a 60-year-old gentleman with chest pain who had a cardiac catheterization last week who's in front of you all sweaty, and you'll say to him, sir, what did your cardiac catheterization show? And he'll look at you confused and say, I don't know, there were, I think, some blockages. That's what you got for me, blockages? Anything more specific than that? And they'll look at you and they'll go, no, no, but doctor, I have Osgood Schlatter's disease. <laughs> and you're like, great. You're a survivor? 
Are you in like some sort of Osgood Schlatter support group? I don't know what it is about that, that disease, but they always remember it. They're 90 and they're still telling you about their teenage Osgood Schlatters. All it is is an apophysitis, right? The insertion of the patellar tendon on the tibia that causes this. And we'll talk about some other apophysitides later. All right, this is actually a pretty important x-ray. So you see a kid with knee pain who's limping, and you get this x-ray uh, as shown here, and you see the little arrows and the big arrow. And what those are are, are metaphyseal corner fractures at the big arrow or bucket handle fractures at the lower one. And there's only one way by which this happens, and it's grinding and yanking on the joint. These are pathognomonic for child abuse, and so they're really important. If you see these, you need to now do the, the whole baby gram or body x-rays. You should start do, doing labs. You need to get social work involved. The, there's a good chance that if you don't recognize this, the mortality of child abuse in, a, in children is about 30% in two years. So in other words, if you miss this as child abuse and send them home, there's about a one in three chance that that kid will be brought back to either your ER or some other ER dead in the next year or two. So these are really, you, you might not even be thinking child abuse. You might just think, because oh, they'll always tell you something, right? What do the parents always say when they bring a kid in? There's always two things. The kid fell. Every child that comes to the emergency room, I don't know, doctor, they fell yesterday off the couch, off the swing set, off the fence, down the stairs, because that's what kids do. They, they run around the world falling. So even when it's not child abuse, the parent always tells you, my kid fell. The other thing they tell you is, he ate something yesterday. Of course he ate something yesterday. He eats something every day. He eats three meals a day at least, and, and then in between those meals he eats shit. You know, candy bars, this, that, anything they can get a hold of. They'll eat the dust bunnies from behind your couch if you let them. You know, so they always think, no matter what a child is there for, the parent will offer up they fell or they ate something. Now, in this case, you'll get that they fell, and maybe the person that brought the child is not the abuser and really doesn't know. So this is a pretty important finding. Osteoarthritis of the knee, really common. We're a population that's aging. We're generally a heavier population than we should be. So obesity and aging are major factors in this. Eventually, you get loss of the joint space. This x-ray just shows a knee with no joint space. That's a typical finding of osteoarthritis. Treatment for this, it's not primarily an inflammatory condition, so it's acetaminophen more than Motrin or ibuprofen, right? It's acetaminophen. Eventually, they may need replacement, uh, but we try to hold off on those as long as possible. Gout. So gouty knee with the crystals there, you see them, and, uh, you know, this is often in an alcoholic, but not always, uh, or a drinker but not always, and they have a red hot joint. You think for the world it looks like sepsis, and you tap it, and then you get the, the, uh, the crystals found on the smear. So here's the risk factors in terms of the diet, but, and while it is that, the bottom risk factor there on the, on the graph, alcohol, at least in my institution, is the number one cause. Remember that the uric acid, you don't need to measure it in acute gout because it can be normal. And you don't give allopurinol to an acute gouty arthritis attack because it's going to make it worse. We don't do colchicine anymore for this. I remember the days when we used to give them a milligram of colchicine IV as a colchicine challenge. And what we learned was that even a single dose of IV colchicine causes renal failure in about a half percent of people. So treating a nuisance disease with a diagnostic maneuver that kills their kidneys didn't seem smart. And so colchicine really should be reserved for the rheumatologist. They'll use it when patients have failed everything else in rheumatoid arthritis, but it really doesn't have a role in gout anymore. So NSAIDs are where you're at. Pseudogout, older patients. Remember, gout likes to hit the same joint over and over again. It gets the big toe, podagra, and the knee. That's most of the time. And they'll get the same one over and over again. They'll get the knee, it'll be recurrent. But pseudogout is older patients, so gout 40 to 50, pseudogout 60 to 70, and it's a different joint every time. It's the wrist, it's the shoulder. It can involve smaller joints, but one of the more common large joints is the knee. And here you see the cal calcium pyrophosphate deposition on this x-ray where the arrow is pointing to these little flecks in the joint space. NSAIDs and steroids. All right, septic arthritis. You never want to miss this. And in, in kids under the age of two, it's usually staph. 
in the teenage years and, and up and through the sexually active years, you see um, some gonorrhea, although the incidence of gonorrhea septic arthritis has been going down and staph has been going up. This joint, when they have staph or, or GC in it, it will destroy the joint relatively quickly. So this is really an, an emergency diagnosis. You gotta tap the knee and you're looking for the number of white cells. Remember that if it's GC, you won't see the organism, right? GC, intracellular, you know all that stuff, but you don't see it. The gram stain, you should expect to be negative if it's GC. And even when it's staph, sometimes the gram stain is negative. You're gonna get a white count, sed rate, CRP, um, the SED rate and the CRP are almost always very elevated. This patient's post-surgical and having previous surgery on the knee is a major risk factor for a septic joint, both the knee and the hip. Recent surgery on the knee within the last six months and now they got a fever and pain in the knee or pain in the hip, that's a septic joint until proven otherwise. Open knee, lacerations above the knee are more likely to cause it, and you have this x-ray down there that shows you it's open because there's now air in the joint. If there's air in the joint, it's an open knee. If you're not sure if it's an open knee, you can do a saline arthrogram or a methylene blue arthrogram to check, and that you need, but you need to put in enough fluid for that arthrogram to work. 150 cc's of fluid is the minimum to put into the joint for an effective diagnostic arthrogram. Usually done with methylene blue. We do a lot of them with saline at our place. But as I say, you need to get a large volume of, of fluid into the joint and then milk that fluid down towards the injury to see if there's drainage of blue fluid out of the laceration. If you've never done one of these, they're pretty easy to learn. But the next time the orthopod or someone's doing them, make sure you stay at the bedside and see what they're up to. Once you see it done, if you know how to tap a knee, basically you know how to do a saline arthrogram. It's the same location and uh, you enter the joint just like you would when you were tapping a knee, but now you're going to fill that joint with methylene blue, diluted methylene blue, by the way. You got to dilute it, otherwise you'll irritate the joint. Patellofemoral syndrome, sometimes called runner's knee. It's subpatellar chondromalacia. You'll see it on a sunrise view where the, where the patella sits in awkwardly. Notice on this lateral view, there's just no joint space under the patella. The, the patella is just riding directly on the femoral condyles, and that's what it looks like when it's advanced. Um, they'll complain a lot about going up and down stairs as well, and if they'll have a positive patellar apprehension test. Bursitis of the knee. Now, one of the ones that irks me a lot is when someone has a big knob over their kneecap, and I look on the chart, and they're calling it suprapatellar bursitis. Eh, try again, right? It's pre-patellar bursitis. The suprapatellar bursitis is relatively uncommon. Note that it's under the muscle, and the suprapatellar bursa is often continuous with the joint. So calling something that's pre-patellar suprapatellar is actually a pretty important mistake because they're completely different behavior in terms of the bursal component. So most of those knobby knees that you see that are all red and you can drain them, please drain them with a needle rather than INDing them. The same with the Olecranon bursa. Because if you drain them with an 11 blade, they tend to drain forever and they develop a fistulous tract and it doesn't work so well for them. So when you're gonna drain a, super, uh, a uh, prepatellar bursa or an Olecranon bursa, drain it with an 18 gauge needle, not with an IND. So there's a, giant prepatellar bursitis, and that would be, you should drain that one for certain. And a lot of times there, what comes out is clear yellow fluid, um, and even though it looks red, this is probably not infected. Most of these are from repetitive trauma being on your knees, um, so we call it carpet nailer's knee, washerwoman's knee, there's another name for it here in Vegas. Um, I don't remember what it is. All right, both the patellar and the quadriceps tendon can rupture, and then the person won't be able to lift an extended leg. And so the extensor mechanism is out. We've already talked about the fluoroquinolones and steroids with risk for this. It's usually pretty straightforward. If the quadriceps tendon is out, then the patella will ride low. You'll have patella abajo. And if the um, patellar tendon is out, then on a lateral view, the patella will be high, and you'll have patella alta. I don't know why we suddenly switched to Spanish for this, but we do. 
popliteal or Baker cyst is one of the causes of swelling behind the knee. Uh, sometimes these cysts will rupture and they'll have a bruise running down the back of their calf. It can look for all the world like a DVT. The good news is, is that ultrasound is used for diagnosing both a Baker cyst and a DVT. So if there's a lot of popliteal swelling, ask the ultrasonographer to look for a Baker cyst while they're looking for a DVT and they'll clarify it for you. And then finally, tennis leg also can be diagnosed with an ultrasound, and this will also hurt into the popliteal fossa. It's a plantaris tendon tear of usually the medial portion of the gastroc, and it's a push-off mechanism. They're pushing off, or sometimes it's a stumble downstairs. Pain in this is usually closer to the knee than it is with an Achilles tendon rupture, and because the soleus and the other head of the gastroc are intact, the Thompson squeeze test will give you the normal expected plantar response. So it will be negative. Treatment is rice and rehab. They usually don't need surgery. This is the last thing I'm going to say. Most of the literature is very clear that we're over ordering MRIs, at least emergency MRIs of the knee. And that it's pretty rare to need an emergency MRI of the knee. The times you ought to be considering it is when there's obvious neurovascular injury. I already talked about the indications for a CT angio when you think the knee's been dislocated. Um, and these probably ought to be discussed because a lot of QA and quality control and cost control is focusing on not doing uh, too many unnecessary MRIs and CTs of the knee. So I think if you're going to order advanced imaging of the knee, it's really worth talking to your consultant or the, or the physician you're working with or finding out sort of what the behavioral habits are at your institution. And there's a, a ridiculous overview, but you can look at it. Thank you very much.